Today we're very uh, lucky to have Cora Dvorkin as the speaker. Uh, so Cora calls herself a, a data-driven cosmologist and she'll tell us more about that today. Uh, she got her undergrad in Argentina, her PhD at the University of Chicago, and then did uh, postdoctoral fellowships at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and was a Hubble Fellow at Harvard. And since 2015, she's been a faculty member at Harvard University. Uh, 2018 got the Physics Physicist of the Year Prize from Harvard. And um, today she's here to tell us about uh, fundamental physics and cosmology. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you very much for the invitation. I would really like to thank the Aspen Center for Physics and the uh, organizers of the conference for giving me the opportunity to talk here today. So my name is Cora Dvorkin. I'm an assistant professor at Harvard. And today I will be telling you about how we can use cosmological observations in order to understand fundamental questions that we have in physics today. OK, so I'm a cosmologist. Perhaps you may ask yourself, what is cosmology? So cosmologists, like myself, study the origin, the evolution, and the faith of our universe, just the small tasks that we have. Um, from a very long time, this was a very speculative field. Uh, we had very little data, but this changed about three decades ago when lots of telescopes all over the world, in the South Pole and the Atacama uh, Desert in Chile, for example, and satellites that were sent to space uh, collected a lot of data, and cosmologists uh, could start developing a more precision field. Uh, so cosmologists are sort of like archaeologists. This is like I like to think about cosmologists, trying to understand our past to better understand the composition of the universe, the present, and the future. So it's always, in general, it's always good to understand our past in order to uh, build a better present and a future. OK, so what we will do today is to go back in time to the Big Bang. And this is about 13.8. Actually, that number uh, was updated. This is about 13.8 billion years ago, OK? And we will figure out what that time can tell us about the universe today. Okay? This is just the small task of the, go of the talk today. So, okay. so let me start saying that we believe the universe started as a very hot and dense plasma of particles. Okay? And atoms were separated into their electrons and protons, okay? And light kept bouncing into electrons. So the particles sort of were being pulled because of gravity, pulled all together because of gravity, but elect uh, photons, sorry, were exerting pressure, so they are going out, okay? So we had uh, the photons uh, made the plasma decompress, and the gravity made the plasma compress. So we have the early universe. In the early universe, uh, we had an oscillating plasma, and we think about it. We call these acoustic oscillations. Now, as the universe expands, and we will talk about how we know that the universe is expanding, it cooled down, and eventually it reached the temperature such that protons and electrons combine into hydrogen atoms, okay? So the universe became transparent, became neutral, and since then photons mainly come toward us without interacting, almost without interacting with electrons anymore, okay? This is a very long and uh, lonely journey that the photons are doing uh, since that time in which the universe became neutral to today. Now, see, these are uh, the photons. These photons that are coming toward us are the photons that we see today. And these photons come toward us carrying messages from the early universe until they just hit our detectors. Um, the light that I study come, again, from about 13.8 billion years ago. So, 
how do we study our past? We are sort of like historians of the universe. How do we do to study the past? How do we understand the Big Bang? And the key here is that we use light to study our past. We can use light to study the past. So why is this? When we look at stars, for example, uh, light coming from stars take sometimes millions of years to come toward us. Uh, so when, so when we are, what we are seeing when light reaches us is how that object was in the past. It took millions uh, of light years to the past to come toward us. And if we look at more and more distant parts of the universe, light takes longer and longer so we can sort of uh, rewind and look at our past by receiving the light that came from regions that are very far away from us or times that are very ancient. So um, this is what I do. I use properties of this light to understand the physics of the very early universe and to understand the composition of the universe as a whole. In particular, when the light from the Big Bang comes toward us, it reaches, at, it reaches the detectors at microwave frequencies. This is why this ancient light is called the cosmic microwave background. So um, here I will show you a movie. Uh, I will start it here, in which you can see that particles of light, the photons that are shown here in blue, couldn't go far without colliding with an electron. With an electron. You see they are all colliding. Uh, as the universe expanded and cooled, protons and electrons, uh, as I said before, formed hydrogen atoms. The universe became neutral. And the light started this lonely journey, traveling through the dark ages where there were no stars, past the formation of the first stars, and uh, it reaches the detector, uh, this light coming from 13.8 billion years ago. Um, now, now um, when, when the uh, light uh, reaches the, okay, let me continue here. A difference between uh, what we do uh, as cosmologists and other fields in physics is that we cannot go back to the beginning and rewind the universe and restart our, our experiment again. So uh, instead, uh, we look at the universe and try to see clues that help us decipher the physics of the very early universe and the composition of the universe. So I like to think of cosmologists also as detectives of the universe, trying to find clues in order to understand what happened in the past. Now, these tiny fluctuations in uh, temperature of this ancient light, that from now on I will call the CMB, to refer to the cosmic microwave background, there are too many words there, okay? So when I see CMB, I'm referring to this ancient light. Uh, so these tiny variations in place to place in the temperature of the CMB are actually linked to initial irregularities in the matter and the radiation of the universe that then were, the matter were then pulled together because of gravity, these tiny fluctuations were pulled together because of gravity, and it formed the stuff that we see today, galaxies, stars, etc. This is really very, very exciting. This, the, we can think about the early universe as a laboratory for testing the highest energies that we will ever, we have ever seen and we will ever be able to see. So just to give you an idea, uh, in the very early universe at the time of the Big Bang, we're talking about a trillion energies that are about a trillion times higher than energies at uh, the LHC, for example, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. So let me uh, now start with the fact that we live in planet Earth, as you all know, uh, which is part of a galaxy. Uh, I'm sure you all know that we live in one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way, which is our own galaxy. Our solar system is part, uh, let me play this movie over here, 
Our solar system is part of a galaxy that contains thousands of millions of stars, okay? So I'm zooming out here, and so much of the pictures that I will show you during this talk are essentially looking at the sky, as you will see now, and opening up to a projection to show a full sky map. And we will see how this happens. This is how we map the sky. We will opening up on a plane. We will project it on a plane. And now you can see that the galaxy lies in the center of this plane. So this ga our own galaxy will appear as a stripe here in the center of this map, okay? So uh, let me stop this here for a second. Let me rewind. Uh, so what you can look at the sky at different wavelengths, okay? And we will be looking at microwave frequencies and we will map the temperature of this very ancient light. So at first glance, this, the first thing that you see is uh, almost uh, a uniform map of a uniform temperature, okay? And this is uh, over here. This is over here. This is what we call the monopole. We see a uniform temperature. The second thing that we see, let me stop it here, this goes too fast. The second thing that we see here, um, when we remove the average of the CMB temperature, corresponding to about, by the way, 2.7 degrees Kelvin above zero, the second thing that we see is what we call a dipole, okay? So this dipole over here is uh, due to the fact that we have a motion, the motion of our solar system with respect to the CMB. Now, this map, when we take out away the dipole, we will see, and now, whoops, no, I didn't want to do this. Let me play here again. Sorry. Here. Uh, so this map is composed of as, at least three components, okay? We will see here the different components of the map. Uh, let me stop it here. Okay. This map is composed at least of three different components, the emission from our own galaxy, the emission from other galaxies, okay? And when we remove those components, what we are interested in is these tiny fluctuations in the temperature just above and just below the uniform temperature of the CMB, okay? So this region over here, this stripe is our own galaxy, and these different colors represent different temperatures just above and just below the average temperature of the CMB or, our, or the ancient light, yeah? Okay, so let me tell you now a little bit of the history of how this light was discovered. The light actually was discovered by accident, so let me tell you how. Uh, in the year 1964, uh, two astronomers working at Bell Labs in New Jersey, uh, Arno Penzias and Bob Wilson, who actually still, Bob Wilson still uh, works at the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard, uh, were experimenting with a horn antenna built to detect radio waves, okay? And to measure these faint radio waves, um, they had to eliminate all possible interference from the receiver. And they did this so by cooling it uh, with he liquid helium at about three degrees Kelvin above zero. So you're getting already an idea of what, where this is leading. When Penzias and Wilson uh, reduced their data, they found a low, steady, very mysterious noise that persisted and persisted in their receiver. They were desperately trying to get rid of this noise. So I used to believe that this was sort of an urban legend, but since I've heard Bob Wilson himself tell the story, I, uh, I, I feel confident to tell you this story, to repeat it here. They even thought the noise was coming from droppings of pigeons, 
and they climb the detector to clean it and get rid of them, and of course, the noise remained. At the same time, in parallel, not very far from them, also in New Jersey at Princeton University, uh, there were some theorists, Dickie, Jim Peebles, who is still a fantastic professor at Princeton University, and Wilkinson were preparing uh, to search for microwave radiation. They were expecting this light coming from uh, the, the standard Big Bang theory. So when a friend of uh, them, the uh, Berkey, professor of physics at MIT, told Penzias about a preprint paper he had seen by Jim Peebles about the possibility of finding this cosmic microwave background radiation, uh, Penzias and Bill Wilson began to realize the significance of what they have detected. They actually realized that what they initially thought was droppings of pigeons was something much more important than that. And they discovered they realized they discovered the cosmic microwave background, and they won the Nobel Prize for this in 1978. Now, many different satellites and telescopes have measured the CMB since then. The first of these telescopes is called COBE, the Cosmic Background Explorer, uh, which operated from 1989 to 1993, and what it found was something very important. It found that the temperature of the CMB is slightly different from place to place, and this is what we saw before. And in fact, they saw that the fluctuations in the CMB are very faint. They are about uh, one part in 100,000. One part in 100,000. Just to give you an idea, this is like uh, the size of my nail over one kilometer, okay? One part in 100,000. They're very, very tiny fluctuations. Um, the red band, again, corresponds to our own galaxy, and this is the map as it was seen by the COVID collaboration. The different colors, again, correspond to uh, temperatures that are slightly above or slightly below the average temperature of the CMB, which is 2.7 Kelvin, as we know today. And uh, for this, they also won the Nobel Prize in 2006. So after COBE, the second satellite, not this one, the second satellite to be launched to space was WMAP. Okay? The WMAP satellite uh, operated from 2001 to 2010. After WMAP and the last satellite that we, we had, uh, was named the Planck satellite, which operated from 2009 to, 2003, to 2013, and they are still actually working on the last release of their analysis. So this is how Planck sees the temperature fluctuations of the CMB. Notice uh, the huge difference between the time of COBE and the time of Planck. Of course, now here I'm not showing you the galaxy, but the same the same applies, we still have our galaxy, nothing changed from 1993 to now. Um, but this is a much uh, higher level of precision. Uh, this is a snapshot, actually we like to think about this as a snapshot of the very early universe. It's a snapshot of the time of the universe when the universe was transparent to light, okay? Photons since then have been traveling toward us carrying uh, information from the very early universe. So when we see this map, we are actually seeing a snapshot of that time. And cosmologists like myself analyze the data. Uh, Nilima was saying that I'm a data-driven cosmologist. I like to analyze the data that different collaborations make publicly available, and I test my different theories. We test, as a community, our different theories. Um, by analyzing the statistical properties of these temperature fluctuations at different positions in the sky, we can infer the physics of the very early universe and its composition and ultimately its faith. So we have this very precise measurement of the cosmic microwave background, but 
what does it tell us about the universe that we live in? So we have a very simple uh, model of the universe. Just a few numbers, six numbers, uh, tell us everything we need to know, really. Uh, at least at, at, at uh, zeroth order. It tells us everything we need to know. We know, we have learned, that we have approximately 5% of ordinary matter. Ordinary matter is what makes you, me, this room, this country, the world, the galaxy, etc. Okay. Uh, we also know that we have a dark side of the universe, uh, about 27% of something that we call dark matter, and we will be talking about this today, 68% of another component that we call dark energy, and we were also going to be talking about this today, uh, we have two parameters for the initial conditions of these uh, seeds of fluctuations, and we can also learn how the first stars were formed, okay? So our model uh, is very simple, but there is a lot of stuff that we still don't understand, okay? We have just six parameters that explain very well our measurements, but there are big questions that we still don't understand. How were the first structures in the universe being seeded? Uh, what is dark energy is still a question that we have today. What is dark matter? And we will go over those questions. For now, they are just names. Let me go a little bit more forward to try to understand better what can we learn from the early universe, okay? Um, i like to show this picture, actually, also because uh, Professor Wayne Hu was my uh, PhD advisor at the University of Chicago. Um, but uh, I like to show this picture because it gives you an idea of the acoustic oscillations that I was telling you about before, okay? We have gravity, we can think about it as a spring. We have uh, these acoustic oscillations happening in the early universe uh, because of pressure from the photons, the particles of light, and gravity, okay? So this plasma in the early universe was oscillating. It was trying to go in because of gravity. It was trying to go out because of the pressure of the photons. Um, and uh, if you change the composition of the universe, you can actually change how these acoustic oscillations happen. And the result of this is a spectrum of sound waves that are useful in understanding our universe. So um, in Harvard, one of the undergraduate courses that I teach is waves phenomena for undergrads. And I like to finish, and so we learn a lot about waves in different media, when the two ends are closed, when the ends are open. And I like to finish the course with an analogy to the early universe. So, um, as I told you, this results, the result of the oscillations in the early universe is a sound spectrum with overtones much like a musical instrument. That's why I like to call it the cosmic symphony. It's a little bit grandiose, the, the, the name, but, uh, but it, gives you, it, it just gives you the idea. So consider blowing into a pipe that is open at both ends, okay? So the fundamental frequency uh, of the sound has maximum uh, air displacement at both ends and minimum air displacement in the middle, okay? The sound has also a series of overtones. This is how inst uh, musical instruments work. Uh, I only know the theory. I don't play musical instruments, but musical instruments work this way. Um, so the sound waves in the early universe are very, very similar, except that now imagine the waves oscillating in time instead of space, okay? So here we have these acoustic oscillations oscillating from the very early universe, uh, and this is much like a cosmic symphony. So a way in which cosmologists just compress their data and try to analyze the statistics of this data is by showing what we know as the power spectrum, okay? Let me explain what is the power spectrum. So if we were to ask, what is the average size of structure in this room? What would you say? It's probably people size, right? like more or less, I don't want to go into heights here, but more or less people's height, okay? 
We can also say that there are also uh, chairs and tiles in the ceiling, and there are lights also that are separated, okay, in the ceiling. Uh, if we measure how much of this room is made of various things as a function of physical scale, this tells us about the power spectrum of fluctuations in this room, okay? So uh, we do something similar with the universe. Here is the CMB power spectrum. I'm showing you the temperature fluctuation squared as a function of angular scales in the sky, okay? So here, for example, are the large angular scales, temperature fluctuations that are separated by 90 degrees, and I average them all out, and I plot this point here, and so on until very small uh, angular separation. Now, um, this is, uh, this, uh, this is uh, data coming from the Planck satellite, and this is our very simple model shown in green. Okay, so in green I'm showing you the very simple model that I told you before that only has six parameters, and the data is coming from the Planck satellite. It is outstanding how we can fit with a very simple model with six parameters, all these oscillations, okay? You may say, okay, you have six parameters, but we have a lot of peaks here, and we can fit it very, very well. And these oscillations actually carry the information of the acoustic oscillation in the plasma of photons, light, protons, and electrons in the very early universe. We see it, okay? We see it here. Um, so uh, this is coming from the Planck satellite, but actually, as I told you in the beginning, there are other collaborations. Other tele uh, there are telescopes, for example, the South Pole Telescope, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that measure these fluctuations. Now, this model is very simple, but as I said before, there is a lot that we don't know. And uh, I will walk you now through some of the stuff that we actually don't know. So it turns out that most of the stuff in the universe, actually 95% of the energy density in the universe is what I call stuff, okay? That I will be more specific a little bit later on, that we don't understand and we call it dark just because physicists like science fiction. Not my case, but in general, they like science fiction. Um, so let me walk you over this dark stuff. Uh, we will start with the component that we call dark energy that actually, right now, today, it comprises the largest portion of the energy density of the universe. 70% of the energy density of the universe, I still didn't tell you what this is, we will go on into details right now, is what we call dark energy. So what is dark energy? Okay, so let's get started with the fundamental physics. Um, so we will start this story around 1929 when an American astronomer, Edwin uh, Hubble, showed that the further away a galaxy is, the more rapidly it's moving away from us. Okay, in other words, he show, you can see the velocity, actually the original Hubble uh, plot was over here in red, but this got extended over the years, okay? So he saw that the velocity increased for further and further uh, galaxies, further uh, galaxies that are further and further away. This means that the universe is expanding. So what does it mean, actually, that the universe is expanding? Well, exactly this, that distant galaxies are receding from us. So the farther away a galaxy is, the faster the recession. Okay? We can uh, think about space expanding in the following way. Okay? Uh, you can think of, of galaxies, this is how I like to, to talk about it, you can think of galaxies as racings in a racing loaf of racing bread. Uh, so whichever galaxy are racing 
uh, you are in, they will, all the rest of the galaxies or basins, will be moving uh, away from you, okay? And the further away they are, the faster they appear to move because there is more space or there is more dough between distant objects, okay? So we, if we start with a map of the galaxy over here, for example, the universe expands, and the same galaxies will be separated at larger and larger distances, okay? Now, how do we figure out how far objects are? Well, one of the best ways of figuring this out is what is known as the method of the standard candles. It's like being in the sea, okay? So imagine you're in the sea, you're in a ship, and you want to know uh, where is the coast. So you could use a lighthouse in order to know how far away you are. A lighthouse, obviously, in the coast, okay? You could use a lighthouse, and this would be our standard candle. So here, our standard candle is a star that exploded in a galaxy or a supernovae, okay? Uh, here you see a galaxy with billions and billions of stars, and one of these stars have exploded, okay? Here you're seeing our standard candle, which is one supernovae um, over here. Now, by comparing, so how do we do this? So by comparing the apparent brightness of two supernovae, we can determine their relative distance, okay? So, uh, so for example, uh, if a supernovae is two times away, it will be four times as faint, and so on, okay? So you can see if you have a, a candle, actually, and you know the luminosity, the luminosity of this candle is fixed, if you put it further and further away, you will see it fainter. And this is how we figure out how, what is uh, the distance uh, that we have to that object, okay, to the galaxy where the supernovae uh, is residing. So supernovae can be used to measure how fast the universe is expanding. But now another aspect of that is that light is emitted by objects of a certain wavelength. Uh, and that light travels towards us, okay? And as the universe is expanding, the wavelength or the color of the light gets stretched, okay? So the color, it starts here and the universe, so imagine we have a bulb or a, some supernovae very far away and it emits light, okay? It emits light in some blue color. As the universe expands, the wavelength of this light, okay, the cycles of this light get stretched. And so, in other words, the color get redder, yes? And we call this redshift. And this allows us to measure the motion of objects that are going away from us, okay? So, once we have the distance and the motion, we can figure out uh, the rate of expansion of the universe. Now, I told you that the universe was expanding, but I didn't tell you uh, more than that. I didn't tell you the rate of this expansion. Well, it turns out that in 1998, observations of supernovae coming from two different groups, one group at Berkeley led by Saul Perlmutter and another group uh, where uh, uh, people like uh, Bob Kirchner, Adam Rees, and uh, Brian Schmidt were working at, they uh, observed supernovae, and they used these observations to infer the expansion rate of the universe. This light, actually, in their measurements, appeared uh, to be coming from further away uh, places to account for the previously known expansion of the universe, okay? So by measuring the slope of uh, the velocity as a function of distance, we can tell how fast the universe is expanding. And if the universe were expanding, was expanding at a constant rate, uh, this 
actually the, the, uh, the measurements, the, the, your predictions would not match uh, your measurements. So they saw from these measurements that actually the light appeared to be coming from further away objects uh, for, to account from uh, the expansion of the universe. And this was uh, the paper of one of the groups. I'm a bit biased here because this group came from Harvard, so I'm showing you this paper over here, but there was another group, okay? Uh, this paper was led by Adam Rees, who, by the way, at the time of this paper, well, or at the time in which, I don't know if at the time of this paper, but at the time in which he was working on this, he was still a graduate student. Uh, so this paper is entitled Observational e Evidence from Supernovae from an Accelerating Universe and a Cosmological Constant, and we will go through that. So as it turns out, the universe was not only expanding, is not only expanding, but is also expanding in an accelerated fashion. It is not slowing down, which is very weird. The expectation in the late 1990s was that the universe should be slowing down, okay, not accelerating. Why is this? Because the gravity of matter that we know exists, because we see it, uh, would attract more matter, and the expansion should slow down. If we, have, if we have heavier objects, we know we all go slower and slower we are, when we are heavier and heavier, okay? So the expansion should be slowing down. But instead, these measurements show that the universe was accelerating in some sort of anti-gravity with some sort of force that counteracts uh, gravity, that, that goes against the force of gravity. Uh, so in 2011, Adam Rees, Saul Perlmutter, and Brian Schmidt actually won the Nobel Prize for providing the evidence that I told you before about the accelerated expansion of the universe. And I'd like to show this picture. This, they look really happy here, of <laughs> course, <laughs> uh, as they should, because uh, they, yeah. Um, so why is the universe accelerating now? We actually don't know. And this is one of the open questions that we have in cosmology and actually in, in, in physics today. Why it's accelerating now? So I decided to show uh, our best guesses here. Of course, there can be other guesses, but I'm showing you some of our best guesses over here, okay? So this component responsible for the accelerated expansion of the universe is actually acting opposite as I told you before, to the attractive gravity. Its uh, important property is that it's repulsive gravity, okay? And this sounds sort of like a strange concept, but it's something uh, like that that Einstein uh, first uh, explained um, could exist in his theory of general relativity. The vacuum of space is full of particles that appear and disappear, okay? They're constantly being created and annihilated. And uh, this has a certain energy associated with these particles. And, um, and the gravity associated is repulsive. We call this the cosmological constant. So the problem with this uh, guess over here is that our calculations are a little bit off from these. They're about 120 orders of magnitude off. So this is an actual problem that we, we still have, okay? It could be a cosmological constant, but we have a serious problem at the theoretical level. Now, another guess that we could make is what I call dynamical dark energy. This is sort of a new type of energy that could come from some field dynamically acting, uh, feeling space, okay? When I say field, you can think about uh, something that uh, takes different values at different positions in space. For, so for example, temperature. Temperature, we have a different temperature here than in uh, Argentina right now. So that's a field, okay? It takes different values in different positions in space. And finally, another possibility, the last possibility that I'm showing here, is that actually perhaps Einstein 
didn't get it all right. Uh, perhaps Einstein's theory of general relativity needs to be slightly modified. We know it works very well, but perhaps it needs to be modified, and there are many researchers also working on this. This is what we call modified uh, gravity. So uh, these are open questions that cosmologists work on, both at the theory level and at the experimental level. Okay, cosmologists like myself, with my research group at Harvard, I also work on uh, some of these guesses. Now, oh, I thought, okay. Um, so now, let's go to the other side of the dark universe, the other part of the dark universe. Let's go to the 25% of the energy density of the universe, the other dark stuff. And this other dark stuff that uh, is 25% of the energy density of the universe is what we call dark matter. And I will explain what I mean by that right now. So actually, I like to say what's the uh, percentage, what's the fraction of the energy density of the unit, what fraction of the energy density comprises dark matter, but I also like to say what fraction of the matter in the universe comprises that dark matter, okay? Of all the matter in the universe, about 80% of the matter, most of it, is dark matter, matter that we don't see. Okay, so let's go over what is dark matter, okay? So, the very first hints of dark matter were actually uh, coming from nine, the 1930s, uh, but the measurements at that time were not good enough, and nobody really believed them. It wasn't until uh, 1970s when the measurements became very good, uh, and uh, it was really due to the pioneering work by Vera Rubin over here, uh, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, that we uh, now understand that dark, we have a strong evidence of, for dark matter. We now understand that something like dark matter should be there. Um, at the time, she actually chose to work on this topic because not many people were working on the topic, so she thought this would uh, give her more freedom to be, uh, to be more inventive. And uh, she made observations at the time, around 1970s, that confused people ever after. Okay, so this was quite impressive. So these were her observations. So she measured the uh, rotational speed of, uh, so let me start by the following plot. So here we are showing velocity, the rotational velocity of matter as a function of distance to the galactic center, okay? So here I'm showing you the galaxy that has the visible matter pretty compact in a bulge, very much in the center, and, uh, and here we are going away from the galactic center. So what you would expect just from Newtonian dynamics is that this velocity, when you go, should rise when you have visible matter, okay? And then when you go further and further away, you have the same matter enclosed going further and further away, which is the visible matter that we see, so this velocity should decrease. Instead, what she saw is that this velocity, this velocity actually, instead of decreasing, remain almost constant, a little bit increasing, but almost constant when we went further and further away from the galactic center. So this meant that there should be more matter out there than what we actually observe, okay? There should be more matter here, now we call it the halo of our galaxy, that should be accounting for that velocity, okay? This was uh, the first evidence for dark matter. We have evidence for dark matter at very different scales, at galactic scales, cluster scales, and coming from the cosmic microwave background. And we will talk about the evidence from the cosmic microwave background in a little bit. I also like to show this picture. Here is a happy version of myself, younger, uh, and happy, uh, and we are here with other fellow cosmologists and with Vera Rubin, who was uh, visiting 
uh, the uh, physics department at University of Chicago. Unfortunately, as I said before, she passed away a few years ago without, in my opinion, receiving the honors that she should have for her incredibly amazing work. Okay. So what Vera Rubin saw is that there is actually more stuff, more matter out there that we don't see around the galaxy, okay? So this slide here summarizes what we know, more or less what we know about dark matter, okay? So there is this, we have a galaxy in the middle, okay, over here, uh, where the luminous matter coming from stars is, okay? And we think that around us there is a halo of dark matter, okay? We call it the dark matter halo. Uh, the visible part is actually about 10 times smaller than the rest, okay? Uh, so you may think how many uh, dark matter, so we, we are surrounded by a halo of dark matter. Uh, you may think how many dark matter particles must pass through, us, through each of us every second. Well, this is actually billions of particles, of dark matter particles, pass through, our, through us each second, okay? But most of these particles, don't worry, most of these particles pass unhindered, okay? Only, it depends on the mass, but only about 10 to 100 particles hit a nucleus uh, of our body in about a year, okay? Now, another piece of evidence I told you the first piece of evidence. Another piece of evidence that I like to show, I'm a bit biased, again, not, not only because this figure is made by Wayne Hu, but also because uh, the cosmic microwave background uh, has a special uh, part in my heart. Uh, another piece of evidence comes from the cosmic microwave background. Here I'm increasing the matter density in the universe. Here you can see that when it's increasing, these peaks go down. And when it's decreasing, these peaks go up. So in measuring the amplitude of these peaks, the relative amplitudes of these peaks, uh, we can know how much dark matter there should be. When we decrease the dark matter, the fluid in the early universe sees no gravitational potential that pulls back. So the amplitudes of the oscillations uh, go up, okay? And this is what we are observing here. Another way in which we can use uh, the cosmic microwave background is by an effect called gravitational lensing. And this is what happens. Let me play this movie over here. As the photons travel toward us, they are slightly deflective through massive structure that they find along the, the, that they run into along the way, okay? This results into something that we call gravitational lensing. This was predicted, again, Einstein is everywhere, this was predicted by Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity, and we can use this in order to map the matter fluctuations in the universe. So this is, very, this is a very recent map made by, uh, Oops, I didn't pass this. This is a very recent map made by the Planck collaboration. This is uh, a map at, uh, that where we, what we are looking at is instead of the temperature fluctuations of the light, we are looking at the matter fluctuations in the universe, okay? And these matter fluctuations were inferred by, their gravitational, by the gravitational lensing effect on the light that is coming toward us. This is uh, much like the picture of Kobe. This is in the infancy here. So we could compare this picture to the Kobe picture that we saw of the CMB temperature fluctuations. So we should expect, really, in uh, the years to come, to have better and better resolution maps of the matter fluctuations in the universe. And this is a way in which we can weigh the matter in the universe. Okay, so let me now conclude by saying that uh, I hope I convinced you today that with precision cosmological measurements, we have learned the composition of the universe pretty well, and the different measurements really agree with each other. 
We also have learned about the physics of the very beginning, and this I haven't discussed this here, uh, but this is also, uh, this should be a topic of another public lecture here. Uh, this is a topic in which, for example, I worked on during my whole PhD, and ultimately, uh, if we know the composition of the universe and the physics of the beginning, we can infer the faith of the universe. So we have a pretty good understanding of the parameters of our cosmological model, okay? These are really percent level precision measurements. We went a, a, a long way when cosmology used to be a speculative science to have precision level measurements of uh, our, the parameters of our model. However, uh, many fundamental questions in physics still remain unanswered. And this is what keeps people like me and Nilima, for example, and people in, in the conference very excited, okay? There is still a lot to be deciphered in our universe. And with uh, the wealth of new information that is coming right now from different experiments and will be coming uh, in the near future from different experiments, we should hope uh, to learn a lot more. So stay tuned. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and now I take questions. Yes. Okay, so the question is, what are the uh, leading candidates for dark matter? So the main paradigm that currently dominates uh, the dark matter field is what we know as the weakly interacting massive particles, or WIMPs, okay? These are particles that interact very weakly with the standard model particles, the ordinary matter, uh, and Different, and it should be around, you know, 10 GeV or 100 GeV of energy or mass. Now, many experiments have been looking for this particle. So, for example, experiments uh, deep underground, what they look is at the nucleon recoil in their detectors. So, if, dark matter, if a dark matter particle hit their detectors, they should expect some sort of kick in uh, the nucleus of their detector. And there are many different experiments that have been looking for this particle, not finding anything, but putting more and more limits in what we call the parameter space. This is how physicists call sort of the space of different parameters that describe dark matter. So this is the main paradigm. Since we haven't, um, it has other nice properties, um, but uh, since we haven't uh, seen weakly interacting massive particles yet, people have started to look for other possible explanations for dark matter uh, that could compose most of the dark matter or at least a percentage of the dark matter. So perhaps, and in this conference, there were lots of exciting talks about this. So perhaps dark matter, uh, you know, perhaps dark matter interacts with itself or perhaps dark matter interacts much more strongly with our uh, standard model, or perhaps the mass is very light, perhaps it's the mass of a proton, or even less. Other uh, candidates, so in these cases, dark matter uh, is just a particle. You could also think about, there are people who think about uh, having a whole spectrum of dark matter particles that sort of resembles our spectrum of uh, particles. So you could have a dark photon and a dark proton and a dark electron, okay? People go uh, wild with their imagination. Um, there are other candidates, for example, black holes. Black holes could also comprise, uh, primordial black holes could comprise uh, the dark matter. Uh, so there are many candidates. I told you the leading candidates, there are other candidates, but we still don't know what it is. So we are still having fun uh, making up ideas and testing them. Of course, you can make an idea, you can sit down very calmly, write it in paper and pencil, but then you have to make predictions and test it against, you know, a wealth of information that we have from experiments. So this is the challenge. Yes? Okay, first a follow-on question to the first question and your answer. How can they 
it possibly be the size of electrons or protons and you might have interactions? Oh, um, so the, you mean the mass of the proton? So the question is, uh, how could dark matter possibly weight the same as a proton or perhaps an electron and not have interactions? Well, they go through sort of different channels. So one channel is the mass. Perhaps the dark sector uh, is different to our sector and doesn't talk doesn't talk to our standard sector, okay? Perhaps there is a whole dark world over there of particles just like our protons, and we call them dark protons or our electrons or our photons, but they may or may not talk to us. So uh, the fact they could be very similar, so we could have a sort of dark twins over there. Uh, I'm, I'm, don't take this seriously, but we could have a dark twins over there and we would never interact with each other. So, uh, yes. We're developing such sensitive instruments, but due to the expansion of the universe and the rap more rapidly accelerating expansion, won't we begin to outrun uh, our ability to see distant light or other particles because it will eventually approach the speed of light asymptotically, which means they disappear at some point. Maybe right. it's millions or billions of years but at some point they disappear, so right. we lose the history. Right, so this is the death of the universe. So the question is, will there be a time in which we cannot see anymore, am I paraphrasing you correctly, because the universe is expanding? Uh, yes, if you extrapolate what is happening right now to the future, then what we should expect is actually that the universe will expand so much that even, uh, you know, atoms will start dissociating. Uh, of course, we will not exist anymore. We wouldn't exist, but anyway, humans will not exist anymore. Everything will start sort of pulling apart, not only galaxies, but even uh, the, 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 the small uh, particles. So for, yes, it's true, we expect that to happen. Uh, and uh, I'm not being pessimistic. This is just an extrapolation of our current theory. But this is billions and billions of years ago away. So, uh, of years away, sorry, not ago. Uh, so in order for the universe to double its size, we have to wait about the age of the universe today. Okay, so just, so the universe is expanding, so at some point it will double its size. This will happen about, uh, in about, uh, you know, the age of the universe today. So you shouldn't worry about getting stretched and, yes. that bumps into ours. So first of all, I think we understand. So the question is if there is a part of the, let me try to paraphrase it and you tell me if I'm doing it correctly. The question is if we understand the CMB correctly, if the CMB can all be understood by the laws of general relativity. And also there is a question about other universes. Oh, I see. So, yeah. Okay. So let me paraphrase. There are lots of things to be said about that question. So the, the last part of the question was that there are uh, scientists who claim that uh, there are cold spots, for example, in seen in the maps of the temperature fluctuations, and these cold spots would not come naturally from our standard model. Uh, so perhaps this comes from a void or another universe. 
Okay, so let's answer these uh, in different parts. So first of all, we think we understand pretty well uh, our standard model of cosmology. We have made, I will go in order, we have made predictions using, of course, the theory of general relativity, and uh, we could see how our model beautifully fits the peaks of the CMB power spectrum. Now, if you look at certain details of the map of the CMB, it is true that, that there are uh, claims of anomalies. This is the, the uh, jargon that we use. There are claims of anomalies in the data. These anomalies are not really super, super significant, but they have some significance, okay? One of these anomalies is, for example, what is known as the cold spot. Perhaps you're referring to this. This is a region um, that is about, uh, I think it's about 40 degrees, in which uh, the universe is colder than what we should naively expect from simulations of different universes. Okay, um, this could be, so people have suggested alternatives to this. This could be uh, because we just happen to live in a universe that had a fluke, I mean, and you know, this could happen randomly, so we happen to live in a universe in which that happens, or it could happen because of, for example, something different than what the simplest models tell us happened at the very beginning in the Big Bang. Now, the question of other universes. Let me tell you, perhaps uh, some of you have these questions. Some of you have heard the multiverse and other universes. What about how do we know that there are other universes? So this is, uh, this is very speculative. We don't know, actually, that there are other universes there. But there is a theory that explains the very first fraction of a second after the Big Bang, known as inflation. I did my PhD trying to understand the physics of inflation, in which the universe was accelerating, uh, you know, exponent in, in uh, so it was expanding uh, in an accelerated fashion, just like now. But this is. Uh, 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang. So 0 0.00, 34 zeros, and a 1 seconds after the Big Bang, okay? So according to this theory, according to this theory, uh, we should expect regions that actually finished expanding in an accelerated fashion and developed, for example, in our universe, okay, we are, uh, well, yes, we are in accelerated expansion right now, but at some point we know that the accelerated expansion of the beginning finished and we had a period in which we were dominated by photons, then by matter, and this is how we understand, uh, this is our standard model of cosmology. But there are other regions that should be still expanding, okay? So there are regions that should already have stopped the expansion and regions that should still be expanding. And this is known as the multiverse, okay? We should expect different bubbles of universes. Um, so, yeah, that was, uh, I, I hope I answered your question. Yes? Oh, good. Yeah, good question. Um, so, so, we know, so what happens with neutrinos? So we know um, that neutrinos actually cannot be, so this is, the question is how do you differentiate between neutrino interactions and dark matter interactions? Okay, so first of all, we know that neutrinos cannot be all of the dark matter. They are too light to be all of the dark matter, and if they were all of the dark matter, actually, uh, the small structures, the smallest galaxies that we observe would not be there, okay? So the structure would be erased because these are very light particles that go very fast, so they would not let uh, the, the matter uh, to collapse in small structures, okay? So we know that neutrinos cannot be all of the dark matter, but neutrinos interact weakly with ordinary matter as well as 
some uh, model, that our main paradigm for dark matter. So there is what we call the neutrino uh, floor, okay? So we should expect interactions of neutrinos with ordinary matter, and we know how to calculate it. We understand neutrinos much better than what we, what, than what we, than what we understand dark matter. We know how we calculate it. We know it should be there. So this is a floor, okay? So the experiments that are looking uh, for uh, dark matter sort of deep underground and they're looking for the nuclear recoil actually model very well that floor and take it, uh, and take it out of their estimates, okay? Yeah? Oh, okay. So the question is, why is the universe accelerating in its, in, in, in its expansion, but galaxies are not expanding? So as I told you before answering to uh, his question, uh, the universe is accelerating at a certain rate, okay? We believe it's about 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So this rate tells us that we actually have to wait about uh, you know, the age of the universe in order to have twice uh, the universe double its size. So we are talking about very large distances in which we can actually see the effect of dark energy. Dark energy is affecting us all, it's affecting everywhere, but the effect on smaller uh, scales is actually very, very small, okay? So if you calculate the expansion of a galaxy due to dark energy, it's negligible. You see the effect at very far away distances. Great question. One more question. Yes. And it started at the time of the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And at the time of the Big Bang, the universe was very small. Yes. Presumably less than 13.8 billion light years apart. Yes. So the, the confusion I have is to understand how the journey could be that long when the universe itself wasn't that long. Oh, okay. So the question is, how can photons from the very early universe, great question, thank you. So how can, the question is the following, how can the photons from the very early universe, from the Big Bang, travel for 13.8 billion light years, while the universe, when it started, was not at all 13.8 billion light years in size? And the key to answer this is that the universe is expanding, okay? So what we call the universe at the time of the Big Bang was a very small and compact and dense region of space with very high energy. But as the light travels, of course it redshifts, as I told you, but also the, because the universe is expanding. So this is why what we call universe is getting bigger and bigger. The universe is expanding, okay? So this is why we can have a photon traveling for much more time than, uh, than it could have at the very big, like from one side to the other side of the universe at the very beginning. At the time of the big, say, re, sorry, could you repeat the question? When yeah. The photon started its journey. Yeah. Your detector, the particles that make up your own light detector now, were very close to it. Yes. And the photon traveled at the speed of light and still didn't get there for 13.8 billion years because the universe expanded so much faster. Did it expand faster than the speed of light? Or? 
No, it didn't expand faster than the speed of light. So the detectors are here now, okay? And the light actually from the very beginning took 13.8 billion years in order to reach us. Uh, it's not because the universe is expanding uh, faster than the speed of light. It's just that the universe is expanding, okay, and light uh, takes a long time. So we are sort of, we are uh, further and further away in time and in space, if you want, because time and space are equivalent, because light travels at a finite speed. So we are further and further away from the beginning. So right now we happen to be at 13.8 billion light years from the beginning. Of course, if you move, if we were, you know, this is what we are living right now, but we could be living, you know, well, we couldn't because, <laughs> because uh, you know, the, the, uh, you can see the plot at the very beginning, okay? So I think this will answer your question here. Um, <laughs> So about 9.2 billion years ago, the sun, the earth, and the solar system have formed, okay? So before, nothing. We wouldn't have been able to build any detectors, yeah.